Hello and welcome to the Patient Educators Update, where we talk about patient education in a clinical environment. I'm Chuck Jones with Synergy Broadcast, and as always, I'd like to welcome our guest, Fran London. Hi, Fran. Hi, Chuck. Fran is the patient education specialist at Phoenix Children's Hospital in Phoenix, Arizona, and she's also the author of the book, No Time to Teach, The Essence of Patient and Family Education. And uh, that book was voted the um, book of the year in 2010 by the American Journal of Nursing. And it's a, just a super practical guide to all things patient education in a clinical environment. And we often use Fran's book as the source for topics, but we're going to stray from that today. We're going to talk about an article that we found, Fran. Um, the article is called um, How to Curb Patient Noncompliance. But we're going to title our episode, The Biggest Mistake We Make as Patient Educators. <laughs> now, let me set this up for you. Okay. The article talked about medical noncompliance being a $100 billion a year problem in the U.S. I would have thought it was more, but $100 billion is where they project it. And they say that um, it's a major problem, especially when it comes to medications, where Americans receive a C-plus in taking medication and that getting patients to change their ways, like we are got to get <laughs> after them, uh, involves communicating with non-compliant patients in a more effective way. Now, this kind of segues into another article that referenced four things, um, quantifying severity, letting patients identify their own barriers, uh, addressing depression, and then leveraging allied staff and technology. Uh, and they also reference a thing called nudging patients in the right direction. I don't know if that's like getting a cattle prod or <laughs> something like that. But I think you probably have some uh, interesting um, uh, opinions about this. Well, I thought about basically what they were all trying to say. And I think it does come down to the biggest mistake that healthcare providers make uh, around adherence, and that's that we assume that patients make decisions about their self-care due to logic. And mm -hmm. uh, we try to fight whatever it is that's not happening with logic. You know, yeah. let's show the charts of risks. and. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The science says you go do this, and so if I tell you, that means you will go do it. But it doesn't work that way. Well, because that's not really what the problem is. Right. Um, they're, they're not doing it because they don't understand. They're doing it because they have other things that are more important to them. They prioritize differently. They have other concerns that are not logical but emotional but very important. And uh, that's why they're not doing what you're asking. So in order to deal with that, we need to better assess what's going on and find out why they're not doing what we're asking them to do. Yeah. So it's all about assessment, once again. Yeah, it really is, and that starts with admission uh, right away to, to try to understand uh, if they know why they're in the hospital, and often they don't. Exactly. There's lots of research that shows that, and even by the time they leave the hospital, they don't know why they're in the hospital. Yeah. Um, they don't know the diagnosis. They don't, they, they're they reacting to what they feel and what they want and that's what you need to talk about and find out how you can best help them move in a healthier direction yeah and and so beginning with assessment you want to do things like what find out why they understand that they're in the hospital mm -hmm. uh, find out how they think they got here what what led up to it and that will help if you listen carefully you find out how they think and how they think about this problem. And then when you address the issue, you use those terms and you put it in that context, and then you can better health coach them in a way that takes them to where you both want to go. Yeah, and, and the key to what you just said is that you're personalizing the instruction and the information for them. Uh, if you take the approach of uh, you automatically assume they don't know anything and you start, you know, wailing away. Um, if they do know a lot about it or if they have some misconceptions, you don't know that. And if they hear something they've heard before, they might just tune out the information. 
which is not going to be helpful for um, improving effective communication, as the article says. Because you're hurting, you're hurting the relationship. Yeah. Because you're you're not giving them credit, you're not respecting their knowledge. That's not going to help. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, talk just a little bit about um, the issues of depression and quantifying severity. Um, you know, they talk about turning up the dial a bit on probability. We've talked about numbers and probability in other episodes, and uh, it's not something that, that patients uh, automatically relate to. No, because it's abstract. And what they want to know is what is their chance of getting this, mm -hmm. uh, the more personal uh, numbers. Yeah. And you can't give that. You can give only populations. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's not helpful. It's helpful when you're describing a problem in general, but when you're coming down to trying to change self-care behaviors, um, you really have to talk about them and what they want, and this is how they get it. Um, so it's got to be personal. It's got to be individualized. Yeah, um, depression yeah. is an issue um, if they're not motivated. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do is to find out what their motivations are and what they want. And some of that may be that they don't believe they can um, achieve anything better than what they've got. So first you have to change that belief. Yeah, because if they don't, if they don't believe it, there'll be no effort to engage whatsoever. Um, and if they're not engaging then you can talk to them all day it's not going to get there you've got to get to a common ground with them where uh, they believe you're on their side they believe you have their best interest and they believe you can help them if they will listen to you because you're going to listen to them to understand what it is that you know is kind of in their way uh, so to speak precisely yeah yep. uh, now you talked a little bit about coaching earlier you mentioned it Coaching is a key part of this because the patient is not going to automatically take what the nurse or doctor says and just go do it. Uh, they're going to stop taking their medicine if they start feeling good because they're feeling good. Uh, and that could have some long-term or short-term bad effects if they do that. Um, so um, there's got to be a negotiation about the importance and, and how you uh, integrate these new behaviors into your new life once you leave the hospital. So talk a little bit about how important coaching is. Well, that's how health co co coaching works. It uh, <laughs> gives them the um, ability to negotiate, to work with you. It respects what they want. It um, helps them decide what the goals are. And they might be shorter than your goals. Um, but you could still move towards that and then move forward after that. So the first thing to do is to find out what they want and to tell them some options on how they might get there and work with that. Much more effective. Yeah, and you know, a, a, an example that comes to mind might be the diabetic who says they don't want to change their eating habits. And if their eating habits are what's putting them back in the hospital, uh, there needs to be some kind of a compromise that there's baby steps that can be taken so that they can understand if they eat their green beans or whatever they need to do that it what won't hurt them and they might actually like them if they you know season them properly and it could be you know uh, f uh, you know fewer trips through the drive through those kinds of things but you you're, if you're not going to get the agreement to the entire thing if you don't get baby steps you're not going to make progress right exactly baby steps are the key and bringing up that example i have um some research that I've read that says if you're trying to help somebody change a diet to a more helpful diet, helpful, mm -hmm. you could uh, ask them to add some healthy items. Mm -hmm. So it's easier to add some stuff and then they end up getting full and eating less of the bad things. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's absolutely true because I know because I've been guilty of eating the bad stuff and when I add a few more vegetables and things to my diet, I am full and I don't eat the other crap and I have no desire to do it. Uh, you know, I went on it's a much easier. That's yeah. much easier than saying, "Oh, I can't have that," and then it becomes some big thing that you can't have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now we didn't talk about this prior to the show, but the article makes an interesting um, uh, comment. They say to prevent patient inaction from leading to costly medical noncompliance, the researchers noticed that nudging patients in the right direction can help them make more productive health 
choices. Now, what, what boggles me about some of these articles is they don't really explain how do you nudge, what right. do you do, you know, and, no, and nobody actually talks about education in a common sense approach. It's all this kind of, well, we're going to nudge them. Well, if you're reading this article, what nudging could have six different meanings to you. And, and you could nudge in an annoying way that could make things worse. Uh, yeah. Um, whereas if you, if you talk about health coaching instead, that has rules, that yeah. has steps, that has things you can follow and do. So, yeah, yeah it helps to, to look at what the studies show. Yeah. Now, that's interesting because if I think about the word nudging and coaching, they are, mean two totally different things to me. Uh, nudging is kind of pushing whether I want to go there or not. Coaching is helping me understand how to do things in a better way. That's my takeaway. Yes, yes. I think they are slightly different, but if you use the word nudge, you might be doing the behavior that's not as productive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Um, great topic. The article is called How to Curb Patient Noncompliance and um, the re Soaring Healthcare Costs That Result from That. And to, to us, it all boils down to patient education, assessing, teaching, measuring, coaching, helping the patient negotiate from wherever they are to where they need to be when it's time for discharge so that they can be functionally health literate and be confident that they can take care of themselves. Precisely. Okay, good. <laughs> See, I listened to you. You did. <laughs> <laughs> and you okay. could probably do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great episode. Why don't you tell folks where they can find you online? Well, I have a blog at www.notimetoteach, and I'm on Twitter at no time to teach. Okay, and you're also on a couple of other sites like Google Plus and um, Facebook. Facebook. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, all that. Yeah, we're all Pinterest. out there. Yeah, and for those of you interested in Fran's book, uh, you can find it wherever books are sold, uh, Amazon and other places. You can download it as an ebook. You can buy it as a paperback. And for those of you that would like to use it in a teaching environment, if you go to Fran's uh, publisher's website, Pritchett and Hull, it's p-h.com. They give a sizable discount for uh, bulk purchases that you can use in group sessions for in services and things of that nature and we encourage you to do that. And if you're interested in adding video and video on demand to your hospital as a tool to help your nurses do a better job with patient education, visit our website at synergybroadcast.com and look for uh, our uh, solutions for patient education. Our product is called MMDS or Medical Media Delivery System. And I wanna also let people know that they can subscribe to us on uh, YouTube, uh, we're, we're, if you go to YouTube and look up Patient Educators Update, you'll find us and you can hit the subscribe button and get us on a regular basis. You'll get a notice whenever we publish a new episode. And we're also on Google Plus at the Patient Educators Update. So, Fran, thanks so much for your time this week. I look forward to talking to you next time. Bye, Chuck. Bye-bye.